Anger management is the title of the sermon today. I'm not talking about movies with that title. I'm not talking about, well, I'm going to talk about a few concepts which psychologists have come up with. And if you go to the internet and you do some search on anger management, you'll find out what their ideas are, none of which will help you. Because as I will show you, they are starting with the wrong premise. And because of that, they are reaching the wrong conclusions. So we are not really interested in what man is saying. We are interested in what God is saying in his word, the Bible. Now many times when we are angry, when we are upset, we may justify it by saying, oh, this was righteous anger, righteous indignation. And of course there is something like justified anger, justified wrath. But in far too many cases, our anger is neither justified, nor godly, nor excusable. Now we all have those moments. I had them. And everything broke down when the equipment died on us. I wasn't too happy. My son-in-law was with us twice. He saw I wasn't too happy. I could have easily said, oh, that's righteous indignation. I'm just very upset about what? What? Now, we have to understand where the anger of man comes from. Notice this in James chapter 1 and verse 20. James chapter 1 and verse 20. A very profound, short statement. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. These are two opposites. And why that is so, we find out in verse 19, in the same chapter. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You see, in order to get to this wrath outburst, you are not swift to hear. You answer before you're hurt. And you most certainly are not slow to speak. No, you are speaking very quickly and very directly without thinking. And this produces the wrath of man. Notice in chapter 3, James chapter 3, Verses 10 to 12. Here is a very important warning. James chapter 3 and verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. You see, cursing an outburst, a product of wrath, of course. It ought not be so. So let's not try to justify our anger by saying, oh, it is righteous indignation. You know, if we are angry with a person, chances are it's not righteous indignation at all. It has nothing to do. With righteous indignation. Notice in Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. And let's look at verse 1. Proverbs 15 and verse 1. It says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So when you are in a conversation with someone, how do you answer? In a soft way or in a harsh way? Well, you have the answer right here. If you answer in a harsh way, you're not going to do with anger at all. Not at all. And so the Bible warns us against anger over and over again. Since we are in the book of Proverbs, look at chapter 14 and verse 29. 
Proverbs 14 and verse 29. It says, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding. But he who is impulsive, emotional, right away answering when something is happening, he exalts folly, foolishness. Foolishness. Notice chapter 16 and verse 32. Proverbs 16 and verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. We have to rule our emotions. Rule our spirit. We have to make, as we will see later on in the sermon, a conscious decision not to become angry. Notice chapter 19 and verse 11. Proverbs 19 and verse 11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. You see? If you don't overlook a transgression, if you hold grudges, you are not a person with a lot of discretion. You are a person who is going to become angry. But that is not what the Bible says. The discretion of a man, of a person, makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook. To overlook transgression. Not to bring up things which might have happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And also, when things go wrong today, it doesn't always have to be brought up. Love covers a multitude of sins, we read. Also notice chapter 21 and verse 19. I know that now some rotten tomatoes will probably be thrown to me, but don't throw them too quickly. Because even though this is very clearly stated here, and I'm just not apologizing for it, it's just what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 19. Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. All right, now this is quite a statement. It's better to dwell all by yourself in the wilderness than with a contentious and emotional and impulsive and angry woman. But before the men become too happy about it, let's also look at chapter 26. Because in chapter 26 and in verse 21, now I give the man a chance to throw rotten eggs at me. Because here's what it says. Proverbs 26 and verse 21. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So both a contentious man and a contentious woman are being referred here as those who shouldn't be in that kind of a situation. They should become less contentious. They should work on their anger. Because he is a man, I mean, he sets the house on fire. Everything burns down, right? Not that that would ever happen to us. But notice chapter 25. Let's go back to chapter 25 and verse 23. The north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue. An angry countenance. All right, so you are in a situation. Maybe you are being criticized. Maybe you are being reproved. Maybe somebody is bringing something to your attention you don't like to hear. How do you react? Backbiting? Well, you have just started an angry conversation. In Proverbs 18 and verse 24, you read something in a very general way. And it most certainly applies to the topic of the sermon. Proverbs 18 and verse 24. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. If you want to be in a crowd of friends, well, you better be here friendly. 
Otherwise, you're going to lose one friend after the other, and then you're going to stand there totally isolated without any friends. If you can't control your anger, if you cannot be friendly towards other people. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And notice verse 9. Now we read about to rule our spirits. Now here it's kind of said in the same way. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry. For anger rests in the bosom of fools. We should take these admonitions very seriously. So from these statements we have already seen that God is not telling you that it's totally all right to be angry. All right? Well, now comes the American Psychological Association. Just to give you one example, I pulled that from the internet. And they're talking about anger management. And sometimes people are being told they have to go to those classes even to listen to anger management lectures. And that's the kind of stuff they're going to be taught. Let me just read to you what this article says. Anger is a completely normal, usually healthy human emotion. It goes on to say, like other emotions, it's accompanied by physiological and biological changes. Now there they are correct, we'll go into this later, but here they say, a certain amount of anger is necessary to our survival. It goes on to say, expressing your angry feelings in an assertive manner is the healthiest way to express anger. Later on, Anger is often regarded as negative, but we shouldn't. Later on, they tell us, well, in order to get rid of anger, what you have to do, you have to go through yoga-like exercises. You know, you have to start using those techniques daily. That helps you with your anger. I mean, these are just a few examples. It says, remember, you cannot eliminate anger, and it wouldn't be good if you could. In spite of all your efforts, things will happen that will cause you anger, and sometimes it will be justifiable anger. Well, there is going to be justifiable anger, as I told you, but all of this is going and is starting from the wrong premise, absolutely wrong premise, that anger is natural, it's a natural emotion which is good. Now, as I will show you, it's a natural emotion, but it's not good. And I will show you also where it comes from. So this is the psychology of today. These are the quote-unquote experts who are trying to tell people what they need to do to get rid of their anger. And they will never be successful. Notice what the Bible has to say. When we get angry, we should very carefully look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Now, first, let me read it to you as the New King James Bible has it. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, verse 27, nor give place to the devil. So it says here, be angry, do not sin. So it almost sounds like that it's all right to be angry. That's not necessarily what's meant here. I'd like to give you a few examples from other translations, how they put it. The New Living Translation says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. The New American Standard Bible says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. But the Wimmeth New Testament says, if angry, beware of sinning. Let not your irritation last until the sun goes down. Taylor translation says, if you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. William says, if you do get angry, you must stop sinning in your anger. Wesley Note says, be angry, do not sin. That is, if you are angry, take heed, you, not, you do not sin. Anger at sin is not evil. Anger at sin is not evil. 
But if we are angry at the person, we sin. And how hardly do we avoid it? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, be reconciled immediately, lose not one day a clear, express command. The, to me, best rendition of this passage can be found in the Phillips translation. And that's what they say. If you are angry, be sure that it is not out of wounded pride or bad temper. It's more like a commentary, obviously. Never go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that sort of foothold. Let me repeat that. If you are angry, be sure that it's not out of wounded pride or bad temper. Never go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that sort of foothold. Yes, it says in the Bible that we have to hate what is evil, but we don't hate the evil person even, let alone a friend who might have done something wrong. If anger develops because of that, it is most certainly not righteous anger. Notice Psalm 37. Psalm 37, and let's look at verse 8. Here's a command God is giving you, giving me, giving all of us. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Now, we're all Christians, aren't we? We all have God's Holy Spirit, and those who don't have God's Holy Spirit yet, God is working with them. This is a command. I'll be following that command. Or do we think, no, there are situations which I don't have to follow these commands? Let me read it again. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. It will. If you are in a situation with somebody where there's anger involved, make sure you cease from anger. Make sure you reconcile. And let me just say something about reconciliation. You don't bring about reconciliation when you start arguing and condemning and accusing. That will only lead to further problems. It's the glory of a man that he can overlook transgression. We might even feel justified in our anger because someone did something wrong. Somebody wronged us, right? But if you are not careful, then our wrath may linger. And Satan can take advantage of us. And that is why we read, don't let the sun go down over your wrath. Make sure you don't have wrath or anger anymore when you go to bed. Make sure you did everything you could to take care of that situation. And what if you can't bring about reconciliation? Because it always takes two. I understand that. Notice Romans chapter 12. Does this justify then for you to be angry? Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 19. It says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. What wrath? Now we are talking about God's wrath. He says, give place for God to deal with the situation. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, verse 20, if your enemy even is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. What's the evil? The evil is not to do this, not to give food to the enemy give drink to the enemy. That would be the evil. He says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What's the good? Well, you feed your enemy even. Now, if you feed your enemy, you must certainly feed your friend, even if you're upset with him or her. I've been in situations where people, even married couples, have been so upset with each other and have seen it, they haven't been talking for weeks to each other. That is most certainly not what is pleasing to God. 
First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two and verse eight. I desire, therefore, says Paul to Timothy, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath. So Paul is saying, I desire that the men in the church pray everywhere without wrath and without doubting, even doubting that it is all right not to be angry. Right? That's what he desires. That's what we should all desire. Pray without wrath. Because if you are angry and you pray to God, chances are God is not hearing you. Now, we know about Moses. Moses is known for his anger. If there was a very well-known person in the Bible, you know, who has been angry at times, I'm thinking of Moses. Maybe you do too. And yes, Moses did have righteous indignation at times, no question about it. But then he also gave in to the wrath of man perhaps being unable to distinguish clearly between the two. Thinking perhaps his human wrath was justified in the eyes of God. But as a consequence, God did not allow him to enter the promised land. And the lesson for us is that we need to be very careful when anger overtakes us. Because first of all, it might not be righteous anger. And even if it is righteous anger, it might lead to unrighteous anger and sin if not controlled. Let's look at a few examples. Exodus chapter 16, and in verse 20. Exodus chapter 16, and verse 20. This has to do when God sent bread, manna from heaven, and he told them specifically that they should not leave it overnight, and some of course did didn't believe God, didn't believe Moses. Verse 20, notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. Now this looks to me like being righteous anger. He was, right, he was angry because he didn't obey God in following his commands. However, the problem with Moses was that he wasn't always angry with righteous indignation. In Exodus chapter 32, notice this one. This has to do, of course, with the golden calf. When he was up there receiving the Ten Commandments from God, and so the people down there built a golden calf. Exodus 32, beginning in verse 15. Let's read that story very quickly. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hands. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other side they were written. And now the tablets were the work of God. It wasn't even his work, it were the works of God. And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, no, it's not the noise of the shout of victory nor the noise of the cry of defeat, the sound of singing I hear. Now, of course, we're talking about the wrong kind of singing in worship of idols and so on. And so it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. So they danced around the calf, apparently also in kind of worship service like people do this today in certain organizations. And so Moses' anger became hot. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in fire, ground it to the powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Now at least his destroying the tablets with the Ten Commandments was something which God hadn't commanded him. That was not the product of righteous indignation. He did it because he was just mad. All right? Now God later told him that that was wrong. In Exodus chapter 34 and verse 1, notice how he puts it. Exodus 34 and verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Now that should have waken him up. There was no reason for him to do that. Now he had to go up again for 40 days and 40 nights 
to receive the second giving of the Ten Commandments, so to speak. But then, of course, the prime example of his uncontrolled anger, which cost him the entrance into the Promised Land, we find in Numbers chapter 20. Now, you read that story, and you can understand Moses from a human standpoint. It was wrong, though. It was terribly wrong. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Now the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh and Miriam, the sister, died there and was buried there. And now there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up this assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain or figs or wines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. And so Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water, and thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and the animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. You can just imagine the scene. He was hot with anger. Now, he didn't do what God told him to do. God told him, speak to the rock. Now, he hit it twice. Now, water still came out. We also have to understand the symbolic meaning here, the rock symbolizing Jesus Christ. So, Moses struck Christ twice in that sense. And God would tell him later, you haven't glorified me, you haven't honored me, you are not going to go into the promised land because of that. And you can read the scriptures in Psalm 106, verses 32 and 33. You can read it in Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verses 48 to 52. You see, the lesson for us is, as we will see, if we don't overcome our anger, we are not going to be in the kingdom of God. That's how serious that is. Anger leads to anger. And so we must be careful how we react when others anger us. See, here the Israelites angered Moses, as we have read. But then he replied in hot anger. And that was totally wrong, unexcusable, unjustified. We read that God's righteous anger will destroy man's unrighteous anger. And you can read this in Colossians chapter 3. I don't want to take the time right now to go into this. Read it in Revelation chapter 11, where God says that the people have gotten angry, and then God's wrath has come, and he is going to destroy those who are destroying the earth. But we also read that God is very slow to anger, very slow. Let's turn to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Now, if we want to imitate God, if we want to have righteous indignation, we have to be careful, first of all, that we don't get angry too quick. But as I said, in most cases, when we have indignation, when we are upset, it's not godly indignation to begin with. Psalm 145, and let's look at verse 8. It says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. That's how God is. Slow to anger. Not quick to anger. He's not hastening his spirit to become angry. He is full of mercy. And notice what we are being told in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, and in verse 18. Proverbs 15 and verse 18. It says, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. 
See, as God is slow to anger and showing his mercy, so we are to be slow to anger and giving mercy to others. And we also read another passage in Micah, chapter 7 and verse 18. You can look at this later. Micah 7 and verse 18, that God does not retain his anger forever. Micah 7 and verse 18. Now, if he doesn't retain his anger forever, even he most certainly shouldn't either. And so, as I said, if people are still walking around with grudges, still talking about things which have happened, I don't know how long ago, they haven't overcome their anger. They haven't overcome their hatred. Now, we must be careful as parents, and I'm still a parent in that sense, even though I have grown children now, but we all, if we are parents, we must be very careful not to provoke our children to wrath. As it says, and let's read it in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, we can easily misunderstand that scripture. This scripture does not mean Never to punish or discipline the children. Because, oh, if I do discipline my child, it may become angry with me about the punishment. And so I'm provoking my child to rest. That's not what this is talking about. It says bringing them up in the admonition of the Lord. It does include punishment, if punishment is needed. Here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, the meaning is, don't provoke them to anger without measure. That's what it means. Without measure. It got to be measured. The punishment got to be measured. It got to be proportionate to the infraction. But this is what it also means. When children become angry, you have to deal with it immediately. Don't let their anger linger. You know, you can't let the children have their way. They don't know yet what is good for them. You got to train them. You got to educate them. You got to teach them. But you got to do it in love. You can never, you must never ever discipline your child while you are angry. Most parents make that big mistake, and they are not going to get any results. Because anger produces anger. Before you, if it ever comes to that point, spank your child, you got to take the child aside. you got to explain to the child why you have to do it, what the infraction was. You do it because you love the child. You do it because you want to have the child understand the punishment is necessary now so that you don't repeat that mistake, that you don't do the things anymore you have been doing. But I'm not doing that because I hate you. I'm doing that because I love you. And when you have done the children's punishment, so to speak, you hug the child and you tell the child again and show the child again that you love him or her. That's what the, ch the church has been teaching for I don't know how long I've been around. Most parents do just the opposite. They either don't do anything or they spank the child in anger, and nothing has been accomplished with that. Now, I'd like to show you a few examples of uncontrolled anger. And the Bible has a lot of examples. And it also shows you where it's leading. Notice Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 8. Of course, a very famous example. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he didn't respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, 
and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. We have read that we should rule our spirit so that it doesn't come angry. God is telling Cain actually the same thing here. You've got to rule over your anger. Of course, Cain didn't do it. Verse 8, now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Cain killed Abel out of jealousy, envy, and anger. In Genesis chapter 49, we find another example. Genesis chapter 49, beginning in verse 5. Here we find the blessings and the curses of Jacob towards his sons. In Genesis 49, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. You see, their anger led to a curse which affected all of their descendants over the centuries until today. They are still all scattered. You can't even justify, or you can't even identify, I should say, exactly where they are today. They're all scattered. Because of the anger of their forefathers, which was uncontrolled. Never think that your conduct has no consequence for the people who are with you, around you, including your children. Now we know about Jonah, I just want to mention this right now. Jonah was told he had to go to Nineveh, he had to tell them in 40 days, you will be destroyed. So then the Ninevites repented, he didn't like it, because he wanted the destruction. And so he goes out and waiting to see whether they might still be destroyed. And then of course here comes a situation with a plant, and then the plant withers overnight, and so he gets very angry. He gets very angry, and so God asks him, well, is that all right for you to be angry? And he says, yes, I am absolutely justified with my anger. Why was he angry? He was angry at his misfortune. He was angry because God didn't act in the way that he thought God should act. Are we getting angry with God? Because things are happening to us which we don't feel should happen to us. Are we getting angry with God because we think that God should act differently than how he acts? Jonah, I believe, repented of his anger because he wrote the book. I don't think he would have written the book if he would have still been in that miserable state of mind. But he had to learn an important lesson. The very famous passage we can find is in Luke chapter 15. It's about the lost son who returns, but I'd like to focus on the brother. So, yes. The son did all kinds of wrong things, absolutely. But he repented. He came back. The father received him. The father even, you know, kept a feast for him. In Luke 15, verse 25, however, Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 25, we read about the older brother, the one who was who had not gone out and had used his money and spent it on prostitutes and whatever the other brother did. Luke 15, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Verse 26. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not want to go in. And therefore his father had to come out to plead with him. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I have never transgressed your commandment. At any time, you, get, you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Soon as this son of yours, not my brother, the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with howlets, you killed the fatted calf for him. 
And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. But it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead. He is alive again. He was lost. He is found. You know, the older brother was angry and jealous. He was angry that the father would celebrate the return of his younger son. And he looked at his own situation. He said, oh no, I am the one who deserves this, not my younger brother. He became envious. He became angry. You know, the Pharisees became angry with Jesus Christ. In John chapter 7 and verse 23, are we becoming angry with other people because they may be treated better than we think they should? John 7 and verse 23. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, Christ is saying to the Pharisees, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? See, they became angry with Christ because Christ didn't keep the Sabbath in accordance with their standards, in accordance with their traditions, in accordance with how they thought it should be kept. And of course, also, they became envious because they understood that more and more people were following him. And so, again, if our standards are not met by somebody else, are we becoming angry with those people? Now, where does anger come from? You see, that's where these psychologists have it all wrong. First of all, the anger comes from the three S's. The three S's. What are the three S's? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, that was a good one. He took my thunder away. He's right. Satan. First of all, the first S, Satan. You see, Satan is a very angry being, extremely angry, especially now, in these times. Notice Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now, whether this has already happened or not, we know that the time is short. We know that Satan is a very angry being, and he wants to install his anger into anybody he can. Verse 17, it goes on to say a little bit later, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, talking about the persecution of spiritual Jews, as I talked about in the announcement. It's going to happen. Who's behind it? Satan the devil. A very angry being. Satan is compared with a roaring lion, looking around to see whom he can devour. A very angry beast in that sense. A hungry beast who wants to kill who wants to destroy, he is called the destroyer. He is called a murderer from the beginning. Secondly, the second S, it's self. It's our human nature. Now that's when those people were talking about it's natural to become angry. They, in a sense, are correct. Natural in the sense that we have all absorbed Satan's nature and have made it our nature. Satan has placed his desires into all of us. And we adopted his way of thinking without knowing it. And at one time, we all, and when I say we all, I'm even talking about those who are converted today, we all were children of wrath, following Satan's evil desires. And we must be very careful that we don't do it today anymore. Notice Ephesians chapter 2. Now, of course, psychologists who don't even believe in Satan have no clue as to what's going on with where anger is coming from. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, notice this. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, like the lost son was dead, but then he was found again. We have been found, hopefully, 
no longer being dead. Verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature uh -huh, children of wrath, just as the others. We were all children of wrath. We were all angry beings. We were all following Satan's evil desires. And of course, as children of wrath, God's wrath was over us as well. But God has made us alive, hopefully, to change our way of life. Now, before we go into that, let's talk about the third S, society. Our environment, our upbringing has influenced us, still may be influencing us. We've got to be careful that we are not becoming angry because the people we are associating with are angry, and so we are trying to copy them. Notice Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, and beginning in verse 24. It says, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, do not go. Now, this also applies to women. That also applies to children, teenagers. They should be careful, too, not to have too close a relationship with angry people. Lest, verse 25, you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. Because it is going to affect you. It is going to affect you. And so here we have the three causes for human anger. Satan, our own human nature self, which is actually Satan's nature, which we have adopted, and the society, the environment. So now how not to deal with anger? So we have identified where it comes from. So what do we do? What do we do? Do we have to go through breathing techniques? Do we go through certain ways which the psychologists tell us here. He talks about, for instance, just going through this article, it gives certain ideas as to what they say we should do. And uh, one is, it should be suppressed. They talk about, you have to calm down inside. They talk about the problem, however, if you suppress it, it says anger turned inward may cause depression, hypertension. It talks about if you let it all out, well, you cause nothing but problems, so they have that right. But let's talk about what the Bible says, how not to deal with anger. Now, many people try to ignore it. They say, oh, I'm not angry. But you see, everybody else can see that you're angry. But you ignore it. No, I'm not angry. But you see, ignoring it will not lead to the solution of the problem. Proverbs chapter 28, since we are in the book of Proverbs, look, look at Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. Proverbs 38 and verse 13. 28, I'm sorry. Proverbs 28, I'm getting it right. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He who covers his sins and anger is, as we will see, a sin. A very serious sin. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses, admits it, and forsakes them will have mercy. So you can't cover it up. You can't ignore it. You can't deny it. That's one way of not dealing with it. Another way of not dealing with it is suppressing it, trying to suppress it, building up anger in yourself, and then suppress it. But you see, that can ultimately, as they have correctly stated, it can ultimately lead to all kinds of health problems. It can lead to an implosion 
a you know, explosion in size. It can cause frustration. It can cause depression. It can cause many health problems. And it won't solve the problem. In Jeremiah chapter 6, God talks about people who are trying to suppress certain things and still kidding themselves as if they had accomplished something. Jeremiah 6 and verse 14. It's talking about the prophets. See, the prophets of old and also the prophets of the future, the false ones. God says, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, superficially, saying, peace, peace. But there is no peace. There is no peace because they haven't really dealt with the problem. They haven't really focused on the real situation. They have tried to suppress it, ignore it and suppress it. And then, of course, there is another way of dealing with anger, a wrong one, and that is to verbalize it. That's where these psychologists are wrong as well. They are letting their anger out. They explode. They blow up like a volcano. In doing it, they destroy others and themselves. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 29. Proverbs 11 and verse 29. It says, he who troubles his own house will inherit the wind. Our anger is troubling our own house. And we will have to live with the consequences. And I'm telling you right now, if we are not dealing with it correctly, we will become very lonely people. So how then to deal with anger? Now we have identified how not to do it. First of all, realize what anger is. What is it? Is it just a healthy human reaction? Is that what God says your anger is? Well, let's look at Galatians chapter 5. What is anger? How does God define it? Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. The works of the flesh are evident, which are Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land, a physical level. We are being told if we don't control our anger, we are not going to be in the kingdom of God. A much more all-encompassing consequence. Anger is a work of the flesh. Anger will prevent us from entering the kingdom of God. So we have to first of all realize what it is. After we have realized what it is, a sinful conduct, we have to repent of it. We have to repent of our anger before God. We have to tell him very specifically. Not just in general terms, oh, God, just help me with my anger. No. Very specifically that we are sorry about it, point out what we did, point out the situations we have been in, point out where we have gone wrong, and tell them we want to get rid of it. We want to stop doing the wrong. We want to start doing the right. Now, you really got to mean it. If you in your mind still think that it is all right to become angry, to tell just everybody anything you just want to, because that's how you feel, you are never going to repent of it. You are never going to get rid of it. You are never going to be in God's kingdom. Notice Psalm 32. And when I'm raising my voice, I'm not angry at you, I'm angry at the situation. Because it is a very, very serious situation. Proverbs 32, I'm sorry, Psalms 32. Psalms 32, beginning in the first one. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, 
whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and his spirit is no guile or no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. That applies us to anger. Here's a person who is angry, hasn't been able or willing to overcome his anger, has been keeping silent about this problem, and is encountering health problems of a serious, serious nature. Notice verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And then you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You've got to come to God in prayer and ask him very specifically that you want to be a changed person, that you want to stop doing the things you are doing, and that you want to do the right things. And you see, it's a time-proven way of overcoming sin, of building character. How do you define character? First of all, you've got to recognize right from wrong. You've got to decide to do the right and don't do the wrong. And then, third step, you actually do the right and don't do the wrong. If he applies this to anger, realize that anger is wrong. Realize that anger is a sin. Decide not to sin. Not to become angry. And then stop singing. Stop sinning. Stop becoming angry. Now, that's easy said. Probably much easier said than done. Because one ingredient, one important step is missing. And that's where all these psychologists, that's where all our human attempts to get rid of anger will fail if we don't go to this very important, all-important third step. So we have asked God for forgiveness. We have asked God to give us repentance. We have realized that anger is wrong, but what else must we do? We must ask God for his Holy Spirit, and that is daily, because it is God's Spirit alone, and I mean alone, which can change you, which can give you the strength and the power to get rid of anger. It's not a matter of suppressing anger. It's not the matter of managing anger. It's not even the matter of controlling anger. That will not solve the problem. The solution is, we must get rid of anger. God must take it away from you. Is he going to do this? Notice Colossians chapter 3. Now, he's not going to do it unless you ask him. But we read very clearly that whatever we ask God, he will do for us. If you really mean it. If it's a good thing. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. First it says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these. Not control, not suppress. Put off. What is it? Anger. First, very first thing. Anger. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. All these things are products of anger, if you understand it. Filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Put it off, he says. You yourselves are to put off anger and wrath. You have a part to play, but you see, you cannot do it on your own. If you try to do it on your own, you will fail. You will never be able to do it. Notice Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. It says, Let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. Put away from you. Not control it, not suppress it, not ignore it. Put away from you. With all malice 
And now, that's not even the end of it. And be kind to one another. That's the opposite to anger. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. You know, when you're angry, you're not tender-hearted. When you are angry, you're not kind to one another. When you are angry, you're not going to forgive one another, as it says here. But God has forgiven you in Christ. And Paul is saying, since God has forgiven you in Christ, you are to forgive your brother, your sister. You know, insisting on you have to change is not going to cut it. Because you can change anyone. You can, with the help of God, change yourself. That's all you can do. That's all you ought to do. Don't try to tell everybody else you must change and then you refuse to change yourself, you see. No, you be tender-hearted. You be a person who is kind to another person. Willing to forgive. Get rid of bitterness. Right. Anger. So that's what you've got to do, but you can't do it on your own. How can it be done then? Notice Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and let's look at verse 13. Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, and we have justified, sorry, we have identified anger, wrath, as a work of the flesh. So if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And brethren, we are talking about the eternal death here. You will die. You will not be in God's kingdom. But it goes on to say, but if, how? By the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live as i said you can't do it by yourself but you can ask god for the power of his holy spirit to help you to do it you are getting rid of the works of the flesh through god's spirit in you or if not in you yet the spirit which works with you that's the only way you can do it in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, as the last passage, let's look at what Paul is saying. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit of God. Pray to God very specifically. Are you doing this daily? Are you praying to God daily for the gift of the Holy Spirit? And if it's talking about anger, if you know you have a problem with anger and you have to get rid of it, are you asking God daily for his power of the Holy Spirit to help you to get rid of anger, not to suppress it, not to ignore it? And are you telling God specifically why you know it's wrong and why you have to get rid of it? Do you understand that unless you do, not only will you create nothing but problems for yourself and others in this life, you won't be in God's kingdom.